Hello, and welcome to Flying Failures, where we'll be looking at the Avro Tudor. Though pioneering, in that it was the first British commercial airliner to feature a pressurised cabin, the Avro Tudor has not been remembered kindly by history due to its many problems, including persistent handling defects, a controversial disownment by its prospective launch customer, a number of mysterious crashes, and the fact that the design, while based on proven underpinnings, was largely outdated by the time it was unveiled, making it but a footnote of the global civil aviation market. Despite this, the Tudor project actually began with great amounts of promise, when the British aircraft manufacturer, A.V. Rowan Company, or Avro, began undertaking studies for an airliner offshoot of its Lancaster IV heavy bomber, which would later be known as the Avro Lincoln, with the firm's highly respected chief designer, Roy Chadwick, suggesting that the bomber's rectangular section fuselage could be substituted for a circular one to produce Britain's first pressurised airliner, with the early concepts being presented to both the Ministry of Supply and the newly formed nationalised international carrier, the British Overseas Airways Corporation, or BOAC, in October 1943, both of whom were impressed by Avro's proposal, and thus sought the advice of the Brabazon Committee, which itself was considering new airliner models that would pave the way for Britain's desired dominance of the commercial aviation market following the end of World War II. Avro's proposition was generally conceived as a stopgap which would compete with America's brand new Douglas TC-4, the idea being to provide a strong contender on the civil airliner scene until the proposals of the Brabazon Committee were brought to fruition in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the committee subsequently agreeing with this approach, with Lord Brabazon himself even stating that while the Tudor proposal wouldn't be an effective substitute for the committee's proposed Type 3A transatlantic airliner, which would later form the basis of the turboprop-powered Bristol Britannia, it would do the job as a stopgap machine fairly well, even though not very economically, and proposed that an intensive study with the design work should take place prior to the committee's proposals. Accordingly, Chadwick and his team began design studies in consultation with the Ministry of Supply, and following discussions with BOAC in March 1944, the Ministry issued Specification 29-43 requiring an airliner with a still air range of 4,000 miles, a minimum payload of 3,760 pounds, and an all-up weight of 72,000 pounds, with a specific request from BOAC, in order to match and possibly exceed the comfort of American equivalents, being that the airliner provide accommodation for 12 sleeper passengers, with a variation in the specification being issued in July 1945 to increase the payload to 5,500 pounds, after Avro had been led to expect better fuel consumption from the Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Although detailed design work didn't begin until June 1944 due to the interference of the war, by August, a mock-up was available for inspection by Ministry and BOAC officials, with the airline's representatives desiring more passenger accommodation, which led to a larger mock-up being produced. While subject to further changes in the overall concept, BOAC approved the Tudor model in February 1945, the aircraft retaining the Lancaster's basic wings, Merlin engines and tail wheel undercarriage, but replaced the bomber's twin tail with a single fin and rudder. In September 1944, a contract for two prototypes of what was known as the Tudor One had been placed, followed in November by an order for 14 production aircraft, and later 20 in April 1945, with the Ministry of Supply acting as sales agent for the Air Ministry, and were based on BOAC's estimated requirements, the official production programme of October 1944, scheduling the completion of the first production aircraft in March 1945, and completion of the initial batch of 14 by August, although the programme was subject to delays as design changes were made, new requirements proposed and production setbacks arose, eventually leading to the first prototype Tudor, Golf Alpha Golf Papa Foxtrot, making its maiden flight on June 14, 1945, the aircraft being powered by Merlin 102 engines rated at 1,750 horsepower, while the airframe was in its most base form, lacking any interior furnishings and not being pressurised. While the initial appraisal of the Tudor's flying manners was looked on favourably, as testing continued a number of handling defects became apparent, which were more difficult to overcome than had previously been envisaged, an extensive test programme being conducted jointly by the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough, the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment at Boscombe Down, and Avro itself, the RAE assigning Captain Eric Winkle Brown, working alongside scientist Joe Lyons, to conduct a thorough analysis of every flight from July 1946. After a few flights with the Tudor, Brown's opinion of the airliner was indeed grim, stating that it had no hope of either gaining its airworthiness certificate or even being able to cross the Atlantic due to excessive cruising drag, 
high engine failure safety speed, bad stalling characteristics, and control difficulties on takeoff. But in their desire to uphold the credibility of the British airliner industry, he and Lyons persevered and listed a string of redesign requirements in order to make the aircraft worthy of carrying passengers. With the recommendations made, Avro undertook a comprehensive reworking of the Tudor concept, including the fitting of a larger tailplane, a bigger fin and rudder, a reshaping of the wing root fillets and extending of the inboard engine nacelles to cure pre-stall buffet, and the adoption of shorter undercarriage legs to minimise bounce during takeoff and landing. The resultant upgraded airliner, receiving a limited certificate of airworthiness in September 1946 and a full airworthiness certificate in November, ending a flight test phase which had commenced 15 months earlier. Although of the 357 modifications required for the Tudor, 343 of them had been sought by BOAC, with 123 considered essential and supported by the Air Registration Board on safety grounds, while the remaining 210 were to be incorporated in all aircraft as soon as possible, and 10 others when convenient. However, while the ARB had stated in March 1946 that essential modifications to the Tudor included a stronger undercarriage, better fire precaution arrangements and improvements to the oil system heating, the required modifications would take time to implement, and the production programme was revised to have the first service model released by April 1946, and all 20 units by October, crew familiarisation flights beginning in September 1946, with prototype Golf Alpha Golf Romeo Echo, which was delivered to BOAC and undertook five months of training work, logging only 83 hours flying time with the carrier before the first production aircraft, Golf Alpha Golf Romeo Delta, was delivered in November for service trials. As BOAC was hesitant to trial a new aircraft on the North Atlantic run during the winter, the crew familiarisation instead took place in Africa, with the Tudor being flown to Cairo and later Nairobi on December 16, 1946, before returning to the UK on January 17, 1947. The airliner accompanied by representatives of the Aeroplane and Armament Experimental Establishment, Avro and Rolls-Royce. Although before the African trials had even finished, BOAC made plain their dissatisfaction with the model to the Ministry of Civil Aviation on December 30, 1946, declaring that the airliner's performance deficiencies made it unsuitable for the North Atlantic run, and that the defects uncovered by earlier testing were much more serious than previously considered these including tail buffeting within certain speed ranges in bumpy conditions, a pronounced tendency to swing on takeoff, faulty heating systems for the cabin, and a high fuel consumption that reduced the range. BOAC squarely took umbrage with the aircraft's ever-increasing weight, rising from £76,000 to £80,000 by early 1947, although Avro blamed this on the carrier's demands for lavish interior furnishings and additional equipment. While due to a lack of marked increases in power output for the Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, there was speculation as to whether the airliner would be able to operate from either unpaved or improvised airfields in some of the more remote regions of the British Empire. By March 1947, 18 Tudor Ones had been produced, with the balance of the Ministry of Supply order expected soon afterwards, although by this point it seemed that the Tudor was never going to enter service with any airline, as BOAC continued to make vocal their disappointment in the model and had determined that no modification to the airframe could be made which would render the aircraft economic to operate, another major disadvantage being the use of a now largely outdated tailwheel landing gear configuration, which was a much more difficult and cumbersome way to operate the aircraft during taxi, landing and takeoff when compared to the emerging nosewheel configuration found on American models such as the Lockheed Constellation and the Douglas DC-4. To try and iron out the airliner's many faults, Avro again proposed an intensive redevelopment program, but with BOAC having lost patience with the Tudor, they formally announced their rejection of the model on April 11, 1947, despite the fact that the fourth production aircraft, Golf Alpha Golf Romeo Foxtrot, had been named Elizabeth of England by Princess Elizabeth at a ceremony at Heathrow Airport on January 21st, the outcome of this cancellation being a major public row between Avro and BOAC, with Sir Roy Dobson, Avro's managing director, claiming that the airline's criticisms had been met by March, and that subsequent corporation statements that the 4,000-mile range was insufficient for transatlantic operations had contradicted its original requirement, BOAC having doubled the passenger accommodation from 12 to 24. Though Dobson declared that the Tudor had been a highly economical aircraft to get through development, taking only three years to reach commercial operation rather than the six years of development undertaken for the Lockheed Constellation, his accusation that BOAC had deliberately dithered when it came to making corporate decisions in order to delay the project to the point that they could seek counsel from the Ministry of Supply as to buying more prestigious foreign models instead, saw the carrier respond through a call for an inquiry into the affair, 
the government appointing a committee headed by retired Air Chief Marshal Sir Christopher Courtney to report on the development and production of the Tudor for BOAC. This infighting, however, served only to damage the prestige of the British airliner industry. With the very public rejection and subsequent inquiry as to the competency of Avro and the airworthiness of the Tudor, leading to other aircraft operators, both domestic and international, abandoning British-built models, the most notable being the Royal Australian Air Force, which cancelled its order for 12 military variants of the Tudor for use as troop transports, while two aircraft, Golf Alpha India Yankee Alpha and Golf Alpha Juliet Kilo Charlie, which had been allocated for use as state transports by the RAF and accordingly furnished with luxury accommodation, were never taken up and returned to the manufacturer. In the end, the findings of the Courtney Report, which was completed in late 1947, were highly critical of the existing aircraft procurement arrangements established by the Ministry of Supply, and calling for improved liaison between the government departments involved, the Ministry of Supply itself, together with the Ministry of Civil Aviation, being highlighted for their lack of interdepartmental coordination and BOAC being criticised for its lack of drive and determination to get the Tudor into service, and thus causing a rift in relations between itself and Avro, ultimately losing sight of the original purpose of the Tudor programme. From what was meant to be a stopgap, BOAC had treated the Tudor as if it were to be the mainstay of their fleet for the next decade, even though new models from the Brabazon Committee were already in the pipeline, such as the de Havilland Comet and the Bristol Britannia and thereby came down to a mixture of demanding too much from an airliner, which was, for all intents and purposes, perfectly satisfactory for filling the role of an interim measure, while also desiring the immediate prestige of American models like the Constellation by deliberately stalling and delaying the Tudor project when it was found that the aircraft couldn't meet the carrier's incredibly specific demands. The only carrier which seemed to have any love for the Tudor was the state-owned British South American Airways, or BSAA, which took on four modified Tudors, in accordance with specification 28-46B, which lengthened the fuselage by 5 foot 9 inches, and replaced the original Merlins with upgraded 621 or 623 variants of the power plants, with seating increased to 32 passengers without a flight engineer's position, and 28 with the flight engineer, these derivatives of the aircraft being christened the Tudor 4, with the first example, Golf Alpha Hotel November Juliet, making its maiden flight from Woodford on April 9, 1947. BSAA Tudors, as part of the naming convention of the carrier, adopting the title Star in reference to the ancient method of celestial navigation used by mariners and even early aviators. BSAA eventually taking on 12 units christened Star Cressida, Star Ariel, Star Panther, Star Lion, Star Leopard, Star Tiger, Star Falcon, Star Hawk, Star Kestrel, Star Swift and Star Eagle while one unit was former BOAC Tudor 4 Golf Alpha Golf Romeo Foxtrot, which retained its name of Elizabeth of England. On September 30th of the same year, the Tudor 4 departed London Heathrow with a 16,500-mile route-proving flight along BSAA's primary corridor to Santiago in Chile via Lisbon in Portugal, Dakar in Senegal, Natal and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and Buenos Aires in Argentina. While following earlier complaints that the Tudor was too small, a larger variant, dubbed the Avro 689 Tudor 2, entered early development, which accommodated 60 passengers through a 25-foot fuselage extension and an increased airframe diameter of 1 foot, while all other flying surfaces, power plants and undercarriage remained unchanged. At a length of 105 feet, the Tudor 2 was the largest aircraft ever built in Britain at the time, and with the model proving to have an increased capacity that was far more favourable in terms of economics, BOAC, Qantas and South African Airways all proposed the introduction of the model for their primary Commonwealth routes to London, BOAC, at one point, even ordering 79 examples from Avro, although the aircraft once again suffered similar aerodynamic problems as the earlier Tudor 1, with trials at Boscombe Down eventually resulting in the fitting of an enlarged fin and rudder, and extended inner engine nacelles. Unfortunately, Following further trials in Nairobi, it became quickly evident that the Tudor 2 had still not overcome the performance woes of the Tudor 1, especially in hot and high conditions. A major problem for carriers such as Qantas and South African Airways, which found it unavoidable to route their Commonwealth services via airports notorious for their hot and high conditions, such as Nairobi and Singapore, leading to their cancellation of the Tudor 2 in favour of Constellations and DC-4s the Tudor 2 orders dwindling to a mere 18 units until eventually only four, including the prototype, were assembled. Another blow for the Tudor 2 came on August 23, 1947, when the prototype, Golf Alpha Golf Sierra Uniform, crashed near Woodford shortly after takeoff, 
when the port wing dropped after the pilot, Bill Thorne, attempted a starboard turn, the engines cutting out and the airliner smashing into trees lining a field at the edge of the aerodrome, with the broken airframe ending up in a pond where the two pilots drowned as the severed cockpit section sank, while Roy Chadwick, the Tudor's designer who was accompanying the flight, was flung 60 yards from the aircraft and died from a fractured skull, the subsequent investigation revealing that the aileron cables had been reversed due to a maintenance error. Despite the death of Chadwick, work continued as to creating an optimised version of the Tudor, which, aside from the original Tudor 1 and enlarged Tudor 2, resulted in the Tudor 3, which was the RAF's executive transport variant that was never taken up, the slightly lengthened and power-up rated Tudor 4 for BSAA, and the Tudor 5, which was powered by Merlin 621 engines, had a 44-passenger seating accommodation, and circular windows rather than rectangular ones this model being originally destined for use with BSAA, but never actually flew in commercial service with the airline, these units instead being stripped of their cabin furnishings and employed as fuel tankers on behalf of the RAF during the Berlin airlift of 1948, while the later Tudor 6 was to be built for the Argentinian airline FAMA for a dedicated South Atlantic service between Buenos Aires and Johannesburg, and fitted with either 32 to 38 day seats or 22 sleeper berths, although FAMA would eventually cancel this order the last of the propeller-driven variants of the Tudor being the Tudor 7, which took the first production Tudor 2 and fitted it with Bristol Hercules air-cooled radial engines, which attempted to improve the performance, but ended up having an inauspicious career, undertaking cabin temperature experiments before being scrapped in 1954. Despite the propeller-driven model seeing a largely non-existent service career, the airframe design proved to be a somewhat easy-to-assemble and hardy structure and thus lent itself to two final variants that were used as experimental testbeds for new jet engine applications in military and commercial aviation, starting with the Tudor 8 of September 1948, which took a regular Tudor 4 and fitted it with four Rolls-Royce Neen turbojet engines grouped in pairs beneath the wings, these being used for high-altitude tests at Boscombe Down and RAE Farnborough, but were never meant for commercial operation. The introduction of the Tudor 8 as a jet-powered civil airliner concept, technically making it the first of its kind ever to fly, beating out the later de Havilland Comet by a year. The trials of the Tudor 8 led to the order for an improved variant dubbed the Tudor 9, which, aside from reusing the Rolls-Royce Neen power plants, also adopted a more conventional nose wheel landing gear arrangement, the aircraft, which would eventually be christened the Avro 706 Ashton, being essentially the pinnacle of the Tudor's design philosophy and could have lent itself to easy conversion into a pioneering regional commercial jet airliner had the impetus been present. Taking its first flight on September 1st, 1950, the Ashton, comprising six examples, was operated by five crew, but the flexibility of the fuselage meant it could have owed itself to enlarged versions if necessary. Test flights for the Ashton including evaluations of jet operations, navigation, and at least one assessment for the aerodynamics of bombing equipment and underwing bomb containers, although despite its achievements, the Ashton was never intended for any service career, the Comet of 1949 having thoroughly eclipsed it as the future of jet-powered commercial aviation. The Ashton, meanwhile, remained as a flying testbed for Rolls-Royce jet engines, including later variants of the Avon for the Vickers Valiant nuclear bomber and the Conway for the Hanley Page Victor and Vickers VC-10, while Bristol Sidley used Ashton Whiskey Bravo 493 as a testbed for its Olympus turbojet, which would later find its way, through derivatives, into the Avro Vulcan nuclear bomber, the ultimately unsuccessful BAC TSR-2 strike aircraft, and the BAE Aerospatiale Concorde supersonic jet airliner, Whiskey Bravo 493, also having the distinction of taking a starring role in the 1960 disaster film Cone of Silence, starring Peter Cushing, George Sanders and Bernard Lee, the movie centering around a fictitious jet airliner dubbed the Atlas Phoenix as it begins to suffer a series of crashes due to it being unable to climb away from the runway in time, the overall premise of the film being inspired by the comet crashes of the early 1950s. In the end, aside from five prototypes for various derivatives, the Avro Tudor's production run topped out at a mere 33 examples with 54 cancelled orders, while its potential operational career was mired in controversy, especially following the loss of two BSAA examples in 1948 and 1949, which disappeared over the Atlantic in an area known as the Bermuda Triangle, and the destruction of Golf Alpha Kilo Bravo Yankee on March 12, 1950, which, due to an improper loading of the 78 passengers aboard, stalled and crashed short of the runway at Landau Aerodrome west of Cardiff, while operating a rugby union private charter from Belfast, 
killing 80 people aboard and leaving three survivors, making it, at the time, the worst aviation disaster in history. Eventually, with the collapse of BSAA and the folding of its assets into BOAC, the Tudor was retired from passenger service, its final roles being with air cargo operators and as test beds with the likes of Rolls-Royce and Bristol Sidley until around 1960, whereupon all surviving examples of both the Tudor and Ashton jet were withdrawn and subsequently scrapped, the only exception being the remains of Ashton II, Whiskey Bravo 491, which is on partial display at the Newark Air Museum near Winthorpe in Nottinghamshire. Overall, the Avro Tudor was never meant to be a long-term arrangement for any of its prospective customers, simply being a temporary fix until the arrival of more refined and advanced models proposed under the Brabazon Committee, which was set to enter service in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The main problem with the aircraft, aside from its many technical and design issues, being a desire by BOAC to have its cake and eat it when it came to what was expected of the Tudor's performance, filling the role of a stopgap but at the same time having all the lavish furnishings of larger and more capable American equivalents, a task to which the airliner had never been designed to achieve, the overarching result being an aircraft forced into two roles, neither of which it was suitably able to satisfy. <laughs>